I, that was what I call Fusari will is chainsaw massacre when I'm talking oh. to <laughs> when I'm talking to the landscape guys. I call that one chainsaw massacre of homes. So just to remind you, that's how it moves around most commonly here in 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 all of California is on pruning equipment. So if you do have a palm you want to keep around, you know, I mean, you might not want to buy your purchase your trimming from the very absolute cheapest guy, you know. Yeah. You may want to go with a guy who uses a clean saw. I've, I've also had people, you know, trimmers want to use spikes. You know, yeah, you got some that you want to use spikes too, and you know, I, I understand it's easier, but that hole is permanent then. It's, it's there forever. You know, palm tree bark, they don't heal their trunk. It's, so if you make a hole in it, it's there forever. So anyway, yep, I'm chainsaw massacre of palm trees. So that's what I call fusarium wilt. So do you recommend chainsaws not being used on palm trees? Or a very clean one. You know, it's it's really hard to clean it completely. But all those little nooks and crannies in the Some people use a brand new saw. And some people use hand saws and they'll, you know, just put a new blade at the base of each and every tree that they're going to so that when the guy's doing it, he just switches to the brand new blade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one thing you, if you're hiring somebody to do that, to talk to them about. Because if they do get it, they can't, you know, you can't go back. You can't get rid of that disease once it's there. And so, can you clean the saw like a, a Clorox? Solution. Yes, yes, you can. You can use bleach, you can use hospital disinfectant. Yes, you can. You've got to get all the little particles off, you know, all the pieces of plant off of it. But because that, if you put that into the tree, it just inoculates it. But yes, you can. Yeah. We have a city contract every year for people to come around and clean all of the palms on the streets of Coronado, and I don't see them dipping it in anything. No, most of them don't. Is there a way that I don't think they'll do it. You can try, <laughs> but I don't think they'll do that. And you know, SDG&E is one of the worst too. You know, they're always pruning trees and they never clean anything. So I have talked to, you know, given talks to like city parks about that kind of thing and you know how it is spread that way but and I think it works for a little while that they'll work on it but then after you know a year or so you kind of forget these things so nobody's looking yeah nobody the boss isn't there today or something so um, you know I, some groups definitely have rules about that and, and enforce it but some don't so it just if you can choose your contractor carefully if you're doing something like that or you're recommending somebody to someone else. So, okay, so much for Chainsaw Massacre of Palms. Um, other diseases that cause similar symptoms in the tree that you might go, oh, it's got it right off the bat. But no, this is where you need, you need a, a, a real diagnosis. You know, before you say, oh, you know, it's losing some fronds, it's got fusarium wilt, I'm gonna take it out you might want to think about that because there are other things that go a lot slower that are, are not necessarily fatal. Oh, and by the way, the fusarium wilt too, it can go, we, have, we seem to have little two different kinds, one that goes really fast and kills the tree in a couple of years, and one that kills trees really slowly, and the, you know, they're, they've been hanging around for years and years. So there's one up at Legoland I've been watching for years and one at SeaWorld. I've been watching for years, and they've got the disease. I've confirmed it, but they're going real slow. And others, you know, they're, once you diagnose them, they're dead within two years. So I don't know whether we've got two strains of the fungus or what's going on. You know, maybe they're taken care of better so the disease progresses more slowly in some areas or not. But so, you know, it's not an immediate death sentence. So um, you can keep them going for a while, I think, if you take care of them really, really well. Okay, other things that cause similar symptoms that I'll get in the lab. And again, you can have the very same kind of things. You can have vascular discoloration. Some of them kind of do one-sided browning, and all of them will do premature loss 
of homes. So, and these are all fairly common throughout California, too, not just here. But, okay, first one is Rakus blight. That's, that's what they call it, that's the official name. Um, it really means that the patio here is infected. And this goes to at least three different kinds of palms. And um, they're called, the name of the fungus is either Ceramomyces or Cocoicola, named after cocoa, cocoa palms, coconut palms. And um, it has raised bumps on the patio that, and it produces strings of rust colored spores. And we've got an example of it right here. Again, it's, it's the old, um, Use the moist chamber, your fancy moist chamber with the paper bag sealed up with the wet paper towel in here. And the fungus will, all this kind of rusty colored spots on here, these are the spores actually exiting right out of the tissue. The fungus is living underneath the bark, under in the tissue, and then when it gets nice and moist and everything, it, it produces this structure that pops out all these zillions of little, and they're actually rust colored in mass kind of football shaped spores. So that's what I'm identifying it based on is these rusty <coughs> colored spores that you can see on this. It's all over it. So again causes premature loss of fronds, but it doesn't this one's not really a fatal disease, but it goes to more than one thing. And you can see here, you know, it's not your exactly one sided browning there. It's it's getting both sides of the fan palm. Yes? You said it's not necessarily fatal. Is it self-limiting, or is it that you can do something to use a fungicide? Um, none of the fungicides work very well on any of these diseases, because the body of the fungus is living in the tissue, under the bark, and they're not exposed. So when you're spraying a fungicide on it, it's just getting the outer part, and they just don't work very well. And they're not designed. Most of the fungicides really aren't. These are. A lot of these are pretty complex fungi. They have complex life cycles. Um, like this one in particular is kind of an um, obligate parasite. It doesn't really culture very well. You can't grow it in culture. So they're, they're more complex fungi than what most of the fungicides are designed to get. And they just don't work very well on them. So they're, therefore they're self-limiting? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's slower growing. Yeah, it doesn't usually attack the trunk. You don't see it on the trunk. You know, the way to kill a plant really fast would be to get into the trunk, like the pink rot does. And the fusarium is, it's in the trunk. But you only see this one on, like, that leaf petiole. Or on this one, too. It's on the leaf petiole, but not on the blade, not on the trunk. So. Okay, so that's our little, our pretty little Ceranomyces. Um, another one that you, you're looking for raised bumps, again on the rachis, on the petiole part, raised bumps. And again, you can, get, you can get browning in the vascular tissue, but then when you put it in the moist chamber, the bumps will kind of come up, they'll raise up and they'll start making spores. And we've got one of that one here too, that's this one. And I do this one a lot by um, feel. You can actually feel the bumps when they start coming up. And it's these kind of little darker areas right here where the, the fungus is living. And uh, whoop, I went back, sorry. So that's Dothiorella. It's fairly common. Now what they've done with Dothiorella is um, it it was a common name kind of for a lot of what now are different fungi, so they've been having a great time splitting it up. And mostly we see Neofusicoccum. They've, they've been changing all the names on you just to confuse us. So, <laughs> but, um, so we're seeing that one come back that way. You've you got to do the DNA testing on it to get the, the right one anymore. And I only... Um, I don't send homeowner samples up unless I think it's going to be something brand new to the state lab in Sacramento for the DNA testing because it's kind of slow, it's kind of expensive, and it really doesn't make any difference as long as you know that you've got one of these diseases on your palm. And this one you can eliminate by just pruning it off. Again, it doesn't really go into the trunk, 
So if you prune off the affected fronds, you're you're probably gotten rid of it if you're really lucky. So um, here's what you know you know those little black spots from before. They're really raised bumps like that right on the patio, and inside of them, it's making spores like that. They're clear. They're big. They're oval. So. That's what, that's actually what those little bumps are doing. They're like little. So how does that spread? Um, that one spreads on water or pruning equipment, yeah. So like if you hose it, because like, it looks like a bug. So if you try to hose it off, you're actually spreading it around? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. see all those little bumps? They're, they're not moving, but they're making all those little tiny spores that then come out. And if you get water on it, they're going to splash around. So they look like else. a little insect or something. Yeah. Well, but they're raised bumps right beneath the tissue until you put them in the moist chamber, and then the spores will come out in a like in a string kind of. So, a lot of like, so you're just helping it if you hose them off. Yes, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and you're giving it extra water because it's going to need free water to germ for the spore to germinate and then infect the tissue. So it's going to need a few hours of free water there to do that. So. Yeah, if you hose it off, that would, that's what will happen, if you have that disease. And if it's making spores, you know, if, if, if it's a short period of time, it's not going to make spores right away that come out. You know, if it's, if it's just, you know, you hose it off and it's dry in an hour, that's not going to make any so difference. So if anybody has any palm problems that ask us questions, should we just have them bring it in? Because I've had people tell, describe something like this to me, and they've made a soapy water and sprayed it. So they're just spreading it around mm -hmm. if that's what be. it is. Yeah. Because they think it's an insect. Right. Now get get a real diagnosis on them. Yeah. That would be your best option. <coughs> and again, we don't want completely dead tissue. Just, mm -hmm. just so you know, um, you know, if you're bringing something into the clinic, if it's already completely dead and dried out, I'm not going to be able to help you much. But if it's half alive and half, gr you know, half green, half brown, is, is even that one is, that's where we can tell, you know. So you need like live samples? Yes. Yeah, not the stuff you picked up off the ground or okay. even with the fusarium, like if you're looking for a fusarium in your palm, you want a really fresh sample. You know, if it dries out, it's no good. You know, these landscape guys, you know, they're only at that place that once, but that, you know, they're really busy. They don't have time to get it into you today, so they throw it in the back of the pickup <laughs> and they leave it there for in the sun for a week. You know, and then they bring it in and you're going, eh. <laughs> Especially for something where you're talking about a vascular pathogen like that, it needs to be fresh. Um, the tips of fronds, which are the easiest to cut, aren't usually very helpful. You know, if you've got a problem, it's going to be back at the part towards the trunk. So again, it's, it makes it really hard for people to get these samples, to get a good sample. Because especially on a Phoenix canariensis, you know, it's 30 feet up in the air. How do you how do you get that sample? And they're big and they're heavy. Now we don't mind. So you know, um, so people a lot a lot of times bring you in a sample that you can't tell anything off of when they're just cutting off the tip of the frond. And so you need the part closest to the trunk if you can get it, or anything with symptoms. You know, if it's got obvious bumps or obvious vascular discoloration, we can usually get something out of that. So, um, what else with the, with the palms? But anyway, so we look for which kind of fungus, you know, which kind of spores does it have? Does it have the nice canoes of fusarium? You know, does it have the little round or the little tiny ovals of pink rot? Does it have these bigger? Bigger rounder ovals of, of Bilthiorella, Neofusicoccum. There's a whole big bunch of these now. Um, another one that does real similar symptoms, the older leaves senesce and die early, is Graffiola leaf spot. I don't think we have that one here right now as an example. But it's pretty common, but this one's only on the pinnae, only on those green, you know, the feathery parts. It's, um, again, only on the phoenix species that I've ever seen it on anyway. And it, again, you can feel this one. It's got, it's got dark bumps on, on the blade. And, um, 
not on the petiole, not on the trunk, just on the blade. And you can get some vascular discoloration. But again, if you put those bumps in the, in the moist chamber, um, it comes out, the spores come out in a nice long string. And it's really easy to identify when you get that. Um, you gotta look carefully, because these are dark colored. Scale insects on a palm, on the, on the leaves, will, make, will be light colored. So, and they'll flick off really easily. You know, you can kind of scrape a scale insect off with your fingernail. You can't do that with these guys. These guys are coming out of the tissue. Yes? When somebody brings that in, it looks exactly like that. Do you even need to put it in a wet bag? I mean, you try to get it off, and it won't come off, and it's clearly those light right. colored bumps only on the blade of the phoenix. No. No, when you've got something that distinctive, no, that's it. And this is another one, you can't culture it. You know, you can try, it won't culture. It's an obligate parasite and only lives on living tissue. So even if I cultured it, it wouldn't do me any good. So no, when I get something that nice, sometimes I'll put it in the bank just for fun of it, just to see the spores, because it's fun. But <laughs> 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 it is a confirmation. You gotta but, get out um, that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're right. <laughs> But anyway, this is another pretty easy one to identify, like the diamond scale. You know, it's, um, you got a phoenix canariensis with bumps on the green parts on the pin A. You got it. All right, this is one where you, you, the tree suddenly snapped off. And uh, you're looking very carefully at it. You see here you've got this black tissue again black tissue and it's soft in the middle you know it's really it's really soft it's rotting away and um, this is the one where the tree will snap off and suddenly you know like a queen palm the top will just snap right off and you know that tons of green stuff will come crashing down um, this is the labiopsis trunk rot and I didn't have any good digital pictures of spores. I don't know what happened to that. But this is what I'm looking for in that tissue. I, am, I usually see these, the uh, chlamydia spores. They're brown. They're oval. They're a fairly good size. They're very distinctive. You can't really miss that one when it's in there. So you just, I take a lot of that brown tissue and, and you know, put it under the microscope and see what I can get. So are, there you can't, some, are there any symptoms before it's snapped off and hurts something? Sometimes or not. Something? No. No, sometimes not. This is one that's totally inside the trunk, totally rotting out the trunk, and you don't see any symptoms until it's too late. So if it's a little one in a nursery, sometimes you'll see symptoms on the leaves. You know, the leaves won't look so great, that kind of stuff. But no, a lot, it, it's the invisible one. So, but it's more often <clears throat> found along the coast. So, because it needs that moisture, that coastal moisture up in the crown for it to snap off there. So it, it doesn't, you, you don't usually see it in the desert. Yes? Is that the same as ground rock? Yes. Because in Coronado, they fall, they fall off the streets because they land on cars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they've, they've killed people. You know, there was one in a, a resort in Carlsbad. Um, a few years back where the tree on a queen palm just snapped right off and landed on the lady who was sunbathing underneath it. Huh? Yeah, it was very bad. Don't do that. <laughs> Is this old palms? Uh, are old palms subject to a trunk slash crown rot? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, this kind of rot. Now, um, now there's more than one, like crown rot can also be caused by Phytophthora species. So you, you may get that, but I don't see that very often. So this is more this is the one that I get more commonly. But you can get a crown rod from Phytopter also. So just, huh? The lady oxis. Yeah. T H I E L A V I O P S I S. The lady oxis. And this same fungus will cause, well, not the exact same fungus, the same genus. It causes a root rot, and I see it pretty often on vincas, petunias, viola, um, it's poinsettias. I'll, it causes a root rot on those plants. So, 
Anyway, this one is a different species than the one that causes the root rot on, on some of those plants, but um, it looks the same under the microscope. When I, and um, some of these times, a lot of times, these things, when they get darker, I call it the Tootsie Roll fungus. <laughs> because the canidia, they're, they're about the, you know, they're a, sort of a similar size. They break up into little sections that look, they all look like Tootsie Rolls. So this one I think of as I'm looking for the Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> all right, here's one that they tell me is here, but I have never actually seen it on a palm tree. So if you ever do see it on a palm tree, I want to see it, I want pictures. Because <laughs> it hasn't been officially reported, at least in San Diego County. But it is another heart rot, another trunk rot. And the only time you see it, the only time you know it's there, is when the fungus sends out its fruiting body. And it's a Ganoderma, just like there are different, there are a lot of different Ganodermas, but you'll see them on Ganodermas on um, hardwood trees also, Brazilian pepper gets it fairly commonly, but I've never seen it on a palm tree. So if you ever see it, I want I want pictures. <laughs> or I want the comp, or I, you know, I really want to see it. But this is another one right rotting out the center of the tree. And if I were you, I wouldn't sunbathe or park under that tree if the wind's coming up. <laughs> so when it yeah. gets to that stage, does that mean it's, it's gone? Well, it's fairly out? advanced because it's fruiting. That, and that means the fungus has been living in the trunk for a long time and has enough health and strength and nutrition to decide to reproduce. So, yeah. Does it look like chicken of the forest or no? No, it's not yellow. It's, it's shiny brown top and then underneath it's all white and all pores. Gazillion's a little pores. Now, chicken of the woods is going to look, it's got pores too, but they're even tinier. But that's a bright yellow when it first comes out. And it's a little softer. It's a little sp spongier. This one's harder, tougher, woody. It's very woody. It's like it landed from Mars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's half of a flying saucer. Yeah, it's an alien invader. But so the three guys tell me it's here, but I don't have an official record of it yet in San Diego County. So let's get one when we can. OK, we're leaving the realm of fungus. And we're going on to bugs. And we've had a quarantine in California. Well, we actually have quarantines in California for two different exotic palm weevils, things that aren't supposed to be here. This was the one that was in Orange County. They have now declared it um, eradicated, so we hope it really is. And we hope never to see it again. But um, it's a very distinctive, these are big bugs, you know, like a couple inches big, like that size. These wow. are big weevils. And it's got very striking red and black, you know, coloration. And so if you see that around your palm tree, be afraid. Be very <laughs> afraid. These kill palm trees. They're going to be up in the bud eating all the new young growth. So that's where they are, and that's where the weevil lays its eggs, and it's the larvae that are in there eating away as, as they grow. And then they pupate, they make these structures and pupate out of them. So if you find any of these kinds of cocoon-like things at the base of your tree, be afraid. So <laughs> these are quarantine pests. So, and this one, the South American palm weevil, we have down by the border here down by at the Tijuana border along there, it, it is there. So and it's gradually moving up. And that one is just an, a big black weevil. So they got these nice long snouts. Look at the antennae on that one. It's got those yeah. funny ends on the antennae. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carvel. Uh, so do they grow for particular kind of palm trees? Again, they love the Phoenix canariensis. Uh -huh. That's their favorite. I know, the poor trees, that's why I say it's endangered. You know? And that's centimeters on the bottom, right? Not inches. Yes, that is centimeters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Sunderson told my friend who lives there in oh, Orange County that they think some kid brought them back as pets from Saudi Arabia, the red one. Ooh. I think that's how they got them. Brought three out of the back in his pockets and so that's that's to the go outside. Wow. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. 
Well, some cultures, well, especially the Asian one here, um, the, the grubs are eaten you know, as a delicacy in the culture. So there was also the hypothesis going around that somebody brought it back to inoculate trees so that they could get the grubs for a delicacy. Yeah, that doesn't sound too like a really good idea either. <laughs> but so, you know, I don't, I, we don't know how they got there, but when as soon as you find them, those trees got to come down. That's, you know, you got to, they got to come down, they got to get ground up. Remove the whole tree. Yep. Yeah, because they're up in the bud, you know, and if you just took the bud off, well, the tree's dead too. So, either way, you, you remove the whole tree. So, and you got to get up in there and inspect it. So, it's, it's quite an adventure to do those things. But, so, we got two kinds red palm weevil, which we hope has been eradicated now, and South American palm weevil on its way here. Well, it, it is already in San Diego County. So and here's how you tell the difference between them. Because I've, I've been called out to look at a lot of trees so far, and I have not found the, the weevil yet myself, but I found a lot of fusarium. So this is the palm weevil damage, and it's in the bud eating the new growth. You know, anything that's new that's coming out. So what's gonna be affected the most is the new growth. So you, you'll see there, your, your older leaves are going to be okay. Now in fusarium, it's usually the opposite. It's the older leaves that are dying, working their way up, and the new growth is still healthy. So it's, it's flipped. So if you got insect, new growth affected, disease, new growth okay so far. So look for, you know, that's the first thing you look for when you're looking for this. And either case kill the tree. Well, in either case, the tree will eventually die, yes. <laughs> I know. <don't. laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good prognosis, but it, at least you'll know, you know which one to worry about. Because if you get this one, then we're going to have to do a quarantine, and we're going to have to look at all your neighbor's trees, and, and you won't be able to move, you know, not that anyone moves palm trees all that often, but you won't be able to move palm trees out of the area, that kind of thing. So, and we don't really need another quarantine. <laughs> we have plenty, thank you. <laughs> All right, this, yes? I gather if anybody saw a, a two-inch two, two, two long weevil, they should call your office. Right? Yes, yeah. well, ideally bring it in. You know, it, it, it doesn't help us to say, we saw one flying by, uh -oh, okay. you know, and, and a, we can't do much there. But if you but if you have one, if you can get your you know get it, your hands on one and put it in a jar and bring it in, then we can identify it for sure. So and these are pretty distinctive, you know. It's pretty, pretty proboscis. Yeah, a big proboscis, those weird clubbed antennae, you know, that red and green coloration. You can yeah, yeah. The the um, South American one's a little harder because it's black. There's a lot of black weevils around, but. Um, so, but that can be done. Anyway, and this is the, the native range right in here of the red palm weevil. You know, it's native to Asia, we believe. And then it's just been moving around and when you, you know, they don't fly that far by themselves. Some, somebody's bringing them around and so now, now we have one in Orange County, which we hope we get to take off that map. <laughs> what does it take to declare eradication? No find, no reports of it, no finds of it, even though you're looking and you've got traps out for a certain period of time. I don't know what it is for that insect in particular, because each insect is different. Based, you usually go through three life cycles, or you have not found it anywhere. So, same with fruit flies. We do a similar thing for fruit flies. You know, we, we declare it eradicated when it's been when no one can find it, and you've got you're actively looking for it with traps and everything for a certain period of time. Usually, three life cycles of the insect, and they've got that for fruit flies. It's just about time down to the minute they can go. Oh, at these temperatures, it's going to go through these generations and this time. So the they is CDA in this case. The, yes, that's the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the CDFA, yes. Yeah, and we work with them on that, but they're the, usually the lead agency in any um, quarantine, unless it's a USDA pest. 
you know, so then all three agencies have to work together. But we're kind of used to that. <laughs> so anyway, there's the native range of the red palm weevil. And here's the native range of the South American palm weevil. It's obviously native to South America. That's the black one. And it's moving its way up, and it's now in the border here, on both sides of the border, Tijuana and our side. So they're, they're watching that one. You know, it's regularly trapped down there in San Isidro. And we're hoping it doesn't keep moving, but you never know. What, what palms does it affect? I know it's the Phoenix Canariensis, and I don't know what other ones. Yeah, I mean, I'm not positive on that one. I'm, I'm not all up on all the bug stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> but then, if you're just looking around at the bottom of the tree for either weevil, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for, you know, detritus, what used to be part of the tree with lots of holes in it. You're looking for holes. You're looking for chew damage. You're looking for insect frass. So, but if you, you know, if this was falling off of your tree, again, that would be a big red flag with all those holes, because that's what those little beetle larvae are doing. They're they're chewing their way through anything and everything. Any treatment? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Right now, they're they're, you know, if you find it, they're taking the tree out. So, I, because it's a quarantine pest, I don't know how the insecticides work. It's really hard to get them down into the, you know, the, into the bud. So, I don't know how that's working for sure. But, so that is pretty much it. Hopefully, that's a date palm grove. Hopefully, we will keep having healthy and happy and beautiful <laughs> trees, and we will figure out ways to feed all these darn pests. But um, that's, that's the last slide. So. so, questions? Yes? I think I've seen uh, red scale, and I think, I think it was identified on the Phoenix mm -hmm. I've seen it quite a lot. Yes. They get a, a couple different red palm scale. Mm -hmm. There's a palm scale. They they get quite a few different scales. Yes. And is there a prescribed? Uh, Those can be treated like any other scale. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And we do get you know just because it can have fusarium and scale insects both at the same time. Yeah. If if one chooses to use uh, a systemic insecticide, please do not call or email me. I'm saying if one chooses, does it move through the palm the same way that it does through uh, dicots? I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I wouldn't think quite as well, but I, yeah, I don't know for sure. So, yeah. If imidacloprid has been helpful in controlling the agave weevil, but you have to get it at the right time. Yeah, so but that's that's a real problem out here in all. Yeah, and I would say, you know, if you're applying a systemic, a nice hot day and then adding a lot of water after that would probably help it pump up. But if you've got a really cool kind of damp day, it's not gonna pick up those it's not gonna pick up the chemical as fast because it's gonna be in the water and moving up with the plant. So if it's pumping out a lot of water you that would move the insecticide in faster and better. So so single large specimen trees should be watered just the way you water the rest of your garden. There's a circular thing around in the dredge for Yeah, you don't, again, you don't want to get water in the trunk, you know, because it's going to rot out those little roots that are coming right out of the trunk there. So the stick is not a good idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hitting the trunk, that's a good way to introduce a rot. <laughs> You can see on my tree that the color of the, of the tree at about four feet is lighter than the rest of the tree because when of the line of the parking strip that tree gets sprinkled. So yep. the color's different, but and the tree's not doing well. Yeah, yeah you, you might have a lovely little trunk rot in there. But those you can't tell till you take it down. You know, you got to slice into the trunk. 
to find out about the trunk rods. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, any more questions? All right, well, you guys, I'm right next door if you ever need me. So.